Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Rod is very pleased to have Digital Theatre back with us, but still in the very early days of physically screening, uh, and we're very pleased that uh, they've brought us King Lear from the Almeida. Uh, I can, I can indeed, yes. I'm very pleased to introduce my ex-students, <laughs> Zoe Waits uh, on no. the far left, and Phoebe Fox, just here. Uh, as you haven't yet seen, or most of you not seen the performance, I'm going to ask Zoe and Phoebe uh, a few questions so that we get their experience of the production out in the theatre and then invite you to ask follow-on questions to that. Uh, but I should say a little bit more of uh, my experience of Zoe and Phoebe and Shakespeare. Uh, and to let you know, I've, I, I've been here 37 years, but the only time um, that this, this theatre has, or any of our theatres, has in the third year done the Scottish play, it featured Zoe in the title role, sporting a wonderful uh, Japanese moustache. <laughs> <laughs> he, should, he should not be releasing this information. <laughs> and a beard, I think, as well. Very rapidly after that, she was playing Juliet at Stratford and a succession of Shakespearean heroines there and has continued a very impressive classical and, indeed, modern career in the theatre. And Phoebe's been working non-stop since she left in the summer of 2010 and very early on in that played Celia in As You Like It at The Rose at Kingston. So, substantial Shakespeare experience, even at, at Phoebe's young age. Uh, I wanted to ask them, first of all, in comparison with the Shakespearean heroines that they've studied and performed, how did Goneril and Cordelia shape up as challenges to bring to life? Zoe, Zoe who I should also say is now uh, a colleague a teacher and director here at Brada. So, um, so uh, yeah, playing Goneril is, is quite a disconcerting thing to do because um, everybody is determined to hate you before you even start. And as soon as they've seen you do it, then they just want to sort of uh, talk to you about what an appalling, heinous individual you are. <laughs> and that's not been my experience of playing. Uh, I have played Regan as well in another production a few years ago. But before that, I played lots of girls in Shakespeare who are all completely adorable and, and everybody loves them. <laughs> So, uh, so it is different. I think, it, I think it's interesting that um, even though Edmund in the play obviously is, is possibly sort of psychotically um, uh, cruel and, and unpleasant, the, the, the main feeling that people come away with about Edmund is sort of one of being charmed by him and kind of slightly aroused and excited and titillated by him. And that's not really the experience with the women, I don't think. Not Cordelia, obviously, but with Regan and Goneril. Um, they are hard to, um, you are kind of wrestling with both of those parts, I think, a bit. And, and Goneril, I think, particularly does lose her, I think he got, he lost interest in her as the play went on, you know. He's quite interested in her for a sort of portion of the play early on. And, um, and then w once she sort of starts sexually unravelling and, and falling for, you know, losing herself in that way, he, he stops being very interested in in her mind and, and what she might think. So that's also, I think, a challenge of that part, I would say. But did you enjoy embodying her? Yeah, I did enjoy <laughs> it immensely, yeah. I mean, I, I think I love the play. So um, I think when you're asked to play a role like that, where you know there's going to be quite a substantial amount of time uh, listening to the rest of the play on the channel, which is true for everyone in the play, uh, apart from Lear, you have to n really, really love the play. And I do love the play. I, I could listen, I have listened to it a, a hundreds of times and I could still do so, you know. I think there's so much in it that's so astounding and so beautiful and so captivating that, that, that just to be in it, I think, is, is worth playing the parts for. But also I did enjoy it, yeah, because it's great getting to, um, you know, face up to somebody <laughs> or, of the kind of ego of, of, of Lear, you know, it, it's, it's fun. I think you have to arrive at it, you know, you have yeah. to, you, you can't, that's what it is, it's a contest, you know, and, and you have to, you have to get on board with that. For all the girls, I suppose, really. Yeah. 
What were the particular challenges of Cordelia for you, Phoebe? Um, I think it's one of the same sort of problems actually with Gonon and Regan is that there's so many preconceived ideas of what these characters should be and what people want from Cordelia is they want to see a, a young, innocent, you know, saintly little girl. Um, but if you, as I did, believe that there was way more to that character and that she, uh, as a human, would also have vices as well as uh, having a great, strong moral core, um, it's hard to sort of negotiate that while still keeping true to sort of the scenes, really, because you can't just put on a sort of badassness to Cordelia because it doesn't really quite work. <laughs> well, <laughs> I tried. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and also, she's off stage for a massive amount of time, um, which is hard, because you're sort of like spending that long off stage and then coming back on um, with renewed energy. But also, like, how has she changed between the end of the first scene and when she comes back? I mean, you have to try and find, uh, I, I thought, that, that she'd sort of grown up and how to portray that because I, um, I wouldn't say it was necessarily um, very obviously in writing, but, yeah. Volumes have been written uh, about the backstory of King Lear, and particularly uh, the lack of any reference to the mother of the three princesses. Uh, Howard Barker wrote a whole play called Seven, Seven Lears, examining that, um, in which he presented... Uh, Cordelia not as their full sister but the daughter of Kent um, and their mother as one explanation of Should have read that. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a, a particular uh, idea that evolved during rehearsal about the backstory <laughs> between Lear and his daughters could you tell us uh, how that came about and what it is and uh, then the audience can see how visible that is or not in the production didn't really. I think evolve is it, a, yeah, it evolves it, it's, it's not exactly. It, we were doing a run of the play, and like um, the final run of the play in the rehearsal room for all the, the designer and the everybody involved with the production who come to see the play. And suddenly, King Lear decided to kiss Goneril. We were like, "Whoa!" <laughs> uh, that, that is, and that's how that it sort of came how. about. But then we sort of latched onto that, like, "Okay, so he's going for the idea that he has a sexual, or did have some sort of sexual, abusive relationship with the two older sisters, but not with Cordelia." And that I thought it was really interesting. Yeah, it, it was interesting. I mean, it, it did really. It was. I think that Jonathan probably had been. Um, mm, mulling over, I don't know, I, it's really hard to know with John whether he had <laughs> deliberately not been doing it and then sort of uh, kind of flung it out there in the middle of a run just to see what, uh, what would happen and so that nobody <coughs> planned what their response might be. So in that way it was quite exciting for all of us because it obviously it immediately changed a great many choices. Um, I think that it does make playing Goner and Regan significantly easier for sure. I, I think it has ramifications for Cordelia that are not necessarily... She has um, to be a bit blinkered. Yeah. She yeah. has to really not know what's going on, because otherwise she's a complete... Twat. Twat. <laughs> um, <laughs> and deeply unpleasant. And deeply, I, I think that it was very helpful for me, because I think John particularly made me the focus of that... Um, I think his sort of idea was that that had been something that had been a significant part of our relationship for quite a long time and, and, and of course it's completely credible in terms of what we understand about you know if, if say for example the mother say Mrs Lear had died during um, uh, we decided during childbirth, childbirth giving birth to Phoebe then, then, then the girls gonna even at the same moment lose a mother gain another child who they see as being responsible for the death of that mother and then also are kind of groomed as their father's sexual partners over the course of that, that time together. Um, so <laughs> that, that was very helpful for, I think, for Jenny and I. I think it was, because I, I suppose, of course, as, as Phoebe said about playing Cordelia, you, you're looking all the time with, with Goneril for finding why she does what she does, how, she, how you can approach that as an actor from the inside, you know, and, and um, 
and find some kind of justification for, for that the kind of extremity of her behaviour towards him. And I suppose that once that had been woven in, that thread, and I guess it, it's for you to see how much you can see. I mean, still at this stage when we filmed it, I mean, we were relatively early on in the run as well. So, so I think it probably developed a bit m more sometimes. It was more pronounced. Um, John certainly, I think, by the end was That's developing, for it. <laughs> was developing yeah. it quite strongly. Um, so, in a, I mean, that was all grist to the mill for me because obviously the more unpleasant and sexually invasive he was, the easier it is to be. So when you lose your your ability to control what you're doing, you know, that the, the easier it is to, to unleash all that hatred upon that person, you know, to turn all that back on them. Phoebe. Can I ask you, was there anything particular about the environment of the Almeida and your physical relationship with the set mm. and the auditorium in playing Cordelia? Yeah. Um, so much of the play dictates, dictates that I'm so bloody close to King Lear. It's, 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 uh, it was really hard. Um, also, I mean, in the production we had, we had sort of lights at the front of the stage like this, which meant that a lot of the time, me and John would be sort of opposite each other, sort of doing this to try and get out of each other's light so that we could be lit in the face. We sort of doing scenes like this, <laughs> which wasn't great. Um, also, it's a weird space because underneath the dress circle is, a com is really hard for people to hear. Um, so you think that you're sort of filling the space, but actually the, the bat just can't hear you at all. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything else. Yeah. You've both already had the opportunity of seeing the film at BAFTA, and how was it for you watching yourselves on the big screen in these no, it's worlds? It's so lovely. It's, awful. it's lovely watching yourself, gigantic, <laughs> on an enormous screen, doing very good acting. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't make you feel uncomfortable at all. <laughs> <laughs> at one point, I looked over at Phoebe, and Phoebe was literally like this. <laughs> it is very disconcerting. I mean, with I mean, it is disconcerting because we don't see it. You know, you don't. It it's not the same so as seeing. I mean, it's all, always horrible seeing us up on screen, but it is. It, 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 you know, it's different because obviously we were performing, and, and it is. It is a deceptive theatre because you do have to work hard, mm. much harder than you would imagine from being in the audience. You, you, it's very, acoustically it isn't that great. You do need to give it quite a lot of welly. You do need to work the space. The underhang is horrible. Um, I mean, it's gorgeous, the Almeida, but it does have, you know, you do need to make it work. And, and that, I think you'll get used to it, but it, 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 it's a, <laughs> it's, it is a bit disconcerting. Because yeah. obviously you would, one would have made different choices if one was doing it for a camera that was here. It's like I was saying to you, when we were filming it, they had video screens around the back, like 10 of them and like 20 people working on it. And um, I came off after being dead and uh, someone said, oh, I could see your eyes moving. I was like, oh <laughs> man, I don't want to know that. You can blatantly see it in the film as well. It was a really supportive company and we were all <laughs> really, really nice about one another as well. Also, it, it's spliced over a couple of performances, so it's not... It's weird because you sort of do a performance that's got an arc of one night and they've sort of taken from three or two, whatever it was, different performances. So that is weird. I find that yeah. weird. Having said that, I mean, Rob has done, you have done a really beautiful job, obviously. <laughs> it's only, <laughs> interestingly, I think the women found Actors, it... Actors, <laughs> I think the women found it more difficult to watch than the men. I don't know what that says. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Either awesome. the men are just all brilliant and... Uh, um, but it, it's, um, I mean, it is, it is lit very beautifully, and mm. the, the environment is very um, textured, isn't it? So it's, and Mike did spend a, an enormous amount of time in the, as far as I understand it, unless he's pretending, in the editing suite, sort of, uh, so I think there was a, a lot of work has gone into making it a piece of um, art in its own right. There, there are some impressions of what you're about to see, and, and hopefully that, that helps you ask more questions to Zoe and Phoebe. Here. Hi, it's Maria Almeida from Latin America. Um, what, what does it feel to, to participate in such an important project with digital theatre at a time in which in the UK the cuts are so strongly you know, causing the arts and the education? Um, do you feel this is wonderful? Please repeat the question. 
sorry. Yeah, yeah, yes. So the question is asking Phoebe and Zoe, how do they feel about participating in this, the digital theatre presentation, particularly at a time in the UK when we're undergoing massive cuts to the arts? I think it's great as well. I mean, also, so many people can't afford to go and see maybe not at the Almeida, but definitely in the West End, the shows there at £65 a pop. I mean, you know, they're pushing up prices uh, to, to deal with the cuts, I'm sure. Um, so the fact that so many people have access to it online for £8 or whatever it is, is amazing, I think. There's so many people I know who didn't get to see it, who have watched it or want to watch it. Um, so you're just reaching out to a whole other group of people, um, which is... Amazing. I remember uh, David Suchet did All My Sons and uh, someone in Japan had seen it and off the back of that got booked a flight over to England to come and see him in Long Day's Journey and Tonight because just from watching All My Sons on digital theatre, which I thought was amazing. Yeah, I think it, it, it is, I think it's a really significant venture at this time, if only because we now have to prove that the arts are, you know, useful. Uh, that theatre is a, is a thing that that, sh that needs to be um, vivid and alive and supported. So I suppose that this is a kind of, um, I don't mean this production, but digital theatre itself is a sort of billboard for, for British theatre um, internationally. But nothing takes away from the fact that it's a very, very difficult time. So causes for celebration are good, but... But a wonderful promotional tool, because as I understand yeah. it, in people knowing about King Lear, go on and watch it, but they also see the existing catalogue, which will go on growing and growing. So once you've had your one shot there, you, you've got a world opening up to you as well. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's really diverse, isn't it, that what digital theatre are covering uh, is a really diverse, already is a really diverse range of theatre experiences, which is also very exciting, as you say, in terms of bringing uh, someone who may not have looked towards X, Y, or Z, you know, in terms of making it available to people, I think is, is a really wonderful, wonderful thing. More questions? Yeah? Absolutely. Uh, one of the things I really tried to push was that she is his daughter. Yeah. And that she's also like her sisters in many ways. They are a family. And uh, I, I also that you want to come away thinking it's, it's awful that she died, but especially because the woman could have won, she could have run the country. She yeah. has that kind of, I won't be fucked with, yeah. you know what I mean, which he has. And... Uh, yeah, I, I, what we discussed is that they have had a, a very private relationship where behind closed doors she would be like, no, I'm not fucking doing that, do you know what I mean? It, that she could stand up to him. And what the problem is in that scene is that she brings their private life into a public domain and he's absolutely humiliated. And she's confused because she's like, well, I do this all the time. What are you talking about, sort of thing. Um, uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that that sort of came out. Good. Yeah, it's the strongest performance I've seen of the theatre. Oh, thank and, you. And read, thank you. Did you find when you were performing with the cameras there that you were, did you feel that you were giving a different performance? Were you more aware of the cameras? Did you forget them quite quickly? I wish I had been more aware. <laughs> <laughs> now that we've seen uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I forgot, and, and, and sort of watching it back, I actually wondered if. Uh, Jonathan just slightly tuned down his performance ever so slightly to make it better for a, having watched a screening of it um, I wish I'd sort of just, just a little 
I think the, you know, the, the weird thing is that you would think probably that that would be quite a big part of your focus. One thing is that you can't see the cameras because they are cunningly the yeah. side, which is a very, very good thing because otherwise you'd constantly be sort of gravitating towards them. You know? <laughs> um, uh, but I think also the other thing you have to remember is that we are doing it with an audience. And that's real, you know. That's not. It's not like suddenly nobody else is there. Is there, and that it's, you know, we are coping with all things that we would ordinarily be coping with. You know, people drying or things happening that aren't supposed to happen, or uh, little sections being skipped or going differently, or you know, 15 people in the stalls cough, or you know, whatever it might be that might happen on any night, for which there's no, you know, that that all that stuff is still going on. So really, you're 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 in the theatre with those with that audience mm. and it, on that night. Um, so that takes so much focus and attention anyway. I think I was very conscious of thinking I can't, just can't go down the route of thinking about them because if I start doing that, then it's just gonna be a disaster because suddenly you're not in the play, you're not in the world of the play, you're not with the other actors, you're not in the theater with the people that have paid money to be there on that occasion. Mm. You know, they, they can't, the people that came can't have a performance that isn't, you know, that, that that's sort of somehow surreptitiously being kind of given for a different, you know, for a different reason. And, and I think also that one of the things about what's amazing about doing it is that it, it, it isn't rehearsed for the cameras. So although it sometimes that sort of makes people a little bit like this, when you're, on the other hand, it does mean that the camera is capturing <coughs> something that does have a very particular quality and life of its own. I've got a question, Louise. Sure. Um, I just wanted to know, obviously, hold on, let me come down into the light because it's a bit dark. Um, you know when you say ref um, tuning down, is it more like refining? Because obviously, we as actors, we're going to go into that anyway. Is it more like, okay, when you're on stage, do you have to turn it down a bit? Or is it just about being, not aware, but being able to just go, this is how I'm going to do that instead? Because, I mean, tuning down just makes it like, oh, it's a bit less. You mean when it's being filmed? Yeah. I would just, yeah, I, I think, or my okay? big gripe with watching myself is that I, I sort of like move my face a massive <coughs> amount, which, and I just thought, you know, maybe if I'd just been aware that the camera's there, I'd just be like, just move your face a little bit less. You can still pump out the voice <laughs> of the body. <laughs> just leave the eyebrows alone, <laughs> and it'll look better on the camera. Yeah. I think. Okay. I think it's partly to do with the fact that you, you're just, you are doing a scene on stage with whatever it is, I can't remember how many women have seats now, you know, there too. And that isn't, it's just not, that's not the, so you are, you're obviously, you're doing the scene, we're doing the scene together, but of course you know, you're also, there's a level at which it's pitched in order that everybody in that building can be party to what's going on, which is a different level from the level that it would pitch if you were in a, <coughs> if there's a camera right here and we're doing the scene like this. I think it's a natural adjustment, which is what's funny about this because it's, the actors aren't making that, uh, you know, adjustment mm. because you can't because there's still all these other people. Uh, a common thing would be, sorry, just to, yeah. to say, for example, so one of the things that often happens, you know, when you're doing, um, when you're doing a show, particularly if it's in town or something like that, so they'll have a kind of, um, They'll often film a little bit to go on TV or something like that. Okay, so uh, a common thing that actors will do, they, they'll call you in for a call, okay, to film a bit of the scene that, you're, that they've chosen, that the director has chosen, which is gonna go on, like, on whatever, t TV, on, on, uh, to add, or it's gonna be a clip that they're gonna show. And when the actors do that bit for the cameras, they don't do it the way that they do it on, that they would do it if they were doing it in front of 2,000 people. It, it, it's a different, everybody is much quieter, people are not using so much voice, people are not using the stage in the same way. It will usually not even be literally staged in the same way. And if you do stage it in the same way, then usually the camera people go, can you just like, can you just not do any of that stuff? Yeah. And you'll end up just literally doing it, kind of chat, talking, just like, you know, talking like this. So does that sort of yeah. answer your question? Yeah. Thanks, Zoe. Thanks, Zoe. Thank you very much indeed. I wish we had more time for questions, but um, we've exhausted the time this evening. Play. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us Thank tonight. You. Thank you. Thank you.